morning, everyone. Happy Lunar New Year. Can we just turn to one another and say Happy New Year? Now, just so I don't forget, um, later when the announcements are given, uh, the Mandarin speaking congregation has prepared uh, some dumplings for us uh, after service. Okay, so that's something to look forward to. Uh, Hopefully, that's not all you're thinking about throughout the message. Um, but, you know, what a, what a joy to be part of a church with, you know, different congregations and uh, to be able to share and fellowship together, especially after worship. Um, and that is something to look forward to. And I think really it, it is a picture of when every tribe and tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And as we break bread together and share in time of eating and food and fellowship together, it really is such a, a blessing time that we can have together. It's been a little while since we've been back in the book of Acts, uh, but that's where we're going to find ourselves today in the Word of God. And I wanted to give a little bit of a reminder of where we last left off. The Apostle Paul is on his missionary journey, and he's establishing churches. There's groups of believers who are placing their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and gathering together, much like we are gathering together this morning, to Remember who God is, who Jesus Christ is, the Son, the Messiah, the Savior that has been sent so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal and everlasting life. And so he's been to many different areas and he's faced rejection, he's faced persecution simply for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've seen him beaten within inches of his life, unjustly put in jail, and yet he continues to trust in God and share and preach the gospel of Jesus. And so most recently, he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ at the Areopagus in Athens, and he now makes his way to Corinth. And we know that, you know, that city sounds familiar because we know that he also wrote two letters to the Corinthian church that he helped to establish in First and Second Corinthians later on. So it's here that Paul will continue to boldly share the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And what I wanted to challenge us to do today is to think about our lives, to think about our calling, not just the Apostle Paul, not just the prophets of the Old Testament, not just the preacher or the pastor, but every single believer is given the call to not only live a life that is devoted to God, but along with that is to share the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And so the question that I have for us this morning, and this is a question I'm asking to each one of us individually, a question that I need to ask myself as well, is have you taken part in this calling to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those around you? Have you taken part in the calling that God has placed upon your life, if you're a believer of Jesus, to share the gospel, the saving gospel of Jesus Christ, with those around you? And if the honest answer to that question is, no, I haven't, or maybe, well, I've been meaning to, then the next question is a great follow-up. Will you, today, as you listen to the word of God being preached, the call that each one of us has to preach the gospel to those around us, will you commit to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with those around you? So that even if you have not taken part in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can always start. You can always begin. You can always make the commitment, and even when you fail, God does not say, hey, what's wrong with you? You failed again. He says, yes, turn to me. Let me strengthen you for the call that I've placed in your life. God reminds us always that when he calls us to do something, he doesn't just say, okay, now work your butt off and, and get to that point where you can do it well. No, God says, I have called you to it, so I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to give you opportunities. Trust in me. Come to me. Find my strength. And so we're going to jump into Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 17. And I hope that we'll be challenged and encouraged by the end of this message, that God will put it on your heart 
to prepare to share the gospel and then to go ahead and do it. There's three points that I have together for us today, but before we get into that, let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your calling. God, that it is not a burden that you place on us, but it is a privilege that you give to us to serve you. That for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, for those of us who believe that you came into the world, that you lived a perfect life, you died on the cross for our sins, that whoever believes would have eternal life, and then you rose again. For those who believe in you, we thank you, God, for the salvation that only you could give to us. And God, as that changes our lives, as that becomes the, the sole motivation for our lives, our relationship with you, would you move in us? Would you convict our hearts to share that saving message with others as well? We thank you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there are three points that I have for us today that we have to share the gospel. It's the calling that God has placed on each and every believer. First thing is this, to work with purpose. Work with purpose. Secondly, to trust in God's promise. And third, to trust in God's providence. So there's purpose, promise, providence. And so we're going to start with that first part, work with purpose. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 4 together for this. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila and a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks." So we're introduced to two new people here in this passage, Aquila and Priscilla. And they were likely Jews who had already come to faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So they're likely Jewish Christians. We see that they're in Corinth because they've been kicked out of Rome by Claudius. And so Paul decides to stay with them. And so within this passage, in these first four verses, one thing that we see is that Paul never compromises his call to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He never stops preaching. No matter what circumstances befall him, he's strengthened by God to continue the call to share the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That's what we see in verse 4, is that he continues to reason in the synagogue every Sabbath. Remember, this is a part of his strategy, if you will. That when he goes somewhere, he goes first to the synagogues because the Jews have the Old Testament scriptures that prophesy about the Messiah. And so they would hopefully have an eye opened, an understanding as hearts are open, minds are open to see that all things led truly to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, as the Messiah. And so he continues to preach the gospel. But he also is working for God. He's working for the Lord. And so this idea of working with purpose is important because he not only is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we also see that he works as a tent maker. So one of the ways that God provided Paul as a means to continue the ministry of sharing the gospel included work as a tent maker. And we see this is a trade that Aquila shared in as well, who he's staying with in Corinth. So Paul's life is devoted to God, is devoted to sharing the gospel, and this means that he has always worked with purpose. So whether that's raising funds so that he can continue on his missionary journey, or through tent making, his own work by his own hands, or reasoning in the synagogue, all of it was to glorify God. The purpose of his life changed when he met Jesus Christ. So you see, if someone says, I am now a believer of Jesus Christ, he has changed my life, but then you see the remainder of his life, and he looks exactly the same, that is a cause for some concern. Not saying that immediately when you follow Jesus that you're completely like devoid of sin and wrongdoing. No, that you're no longer selfish or that you no longer struggle. No, but there is a change in purpose for all that you do. So whether it's your nine to five, or whether it's when you're with your spouse or your family, your significant other, your friends, whoever it might be, that your purpose is no longer for yourself and self 
self-gratification, self-glory. No, it is for God, and we see that in Paul as he shares the gospel message, but he also works as a tent maker to raise money so he can continue to do the ministry that God has called him to. And the cool thing about it is this. Paul, remember who he was. He was someone who persecuted the church. And Jesus met him, and he asked the question, why do you persecute me? And when Jesus Christ met Paul where he was at, known as Saul at the time, we know that right then and there, Saul could have been struck dead. That could have been the judgment for his life for disobeying God and actually attacking God and being an enemy of God, persecuting, killing Christians. And yet Jesus did not do that. Instead, he extends a hand of grace to Paul. And so when Paul repents and he places his faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, this purpose in his life changes. And what I would argue is this. That yes, Paul knows the scriptures well. And he knows how to draw the gospel out. He doesn't force it in. The gospel in the Old Testament is chock full of just images and messages about Jesus Christ, the Messiah to come. But it's not only through scripture that he reveals the gospel message of Jesus Christ. It's also through his testimony. The very life that he's living is preaching the gospel to each of the people that he meets with and talks to about Jesus Christ. Though he once was an enemy of Christ, attacking, now he lives to tell of the Jesus who died for his sins. He lives now to share Jesus who rose from the dead. He shares the gospel of Jesus Christ. He works with purpose. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says this, and this is Paul writing to the church in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So with this purpose in Christ, this relationship he has with Jesus, he knows that it means everything. That's the most important thing in his life. No other relationship comes ahead of it. That is his purpose. It's what motivates him to live his life. And as he shares the gospel, he knows where the power lies. We know that Paul was very intellectual. We know that he knows the scriptures inside and out. But he says this, for it is the power of God. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It's not his intellect It's not his eloquence. No, the power is in the very truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ itself. And so there's power when the gospel is preached. And there's power when someone is hearing the gospel being preached. And so this is a question that I have for you as you work with purpose. What is keeping you from being the one to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? What keeps you from sharing boldly the message of Jesus Christ, the one who has saved you, changed your life, and given you purpose? Maybe sometimes we feel like we're not a good enough Christian. Maybe we feel like we haven't been obeying God, we haven't been living right, we've felt far away from God. Guess what? You can still share the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the power is not about how well you succeed in Christian life. It's about the power of Jesus Christ, his grace that is sufficient for you. Now, that doesn't mean go and live your life however you want and it's all good. But it means that any person, when they share the gospel message of Jesus Christ, there is an opportunity for someone who is listening for their whole eternity, their lives to be changed because the power is in the gospel of Jesus Christ itself. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Anyone who hears the message, anyone with a desire to repent and believe in Jesus will be saved. And so what is keeping you from being the one to share the gospel with your friend, with your family members, 
with your classmates, with your co-workers. Trust in the power of God through the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Amen? This is living with purpose, working with purpose. And I thought about that in today's context. What does that look like for us today? When we think about working, we think about it as a means of providing, right, for family, for loved ones, for ourselves. We think about it as a means of gaining, you know, uh, security, financial security. Maybe we think about it as a means of showing people that we worked hard and so we earned And so work has a lot of different aspects to it, but what does it look like to work with purpose for God? The fathers here, the husbands here, the wives, everyone who is working, what does it mean for you to work with purpose? I thought about that. You know, if you're just working to provide financially for your family, that's a good thing. To, to provide financially, that, that's a call that we have to take care of our families. But what is the greatest thing that you could ever provide for your children, for your family? It's actually the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no greater thing, more than clothes on our children's backs. More than food for them to eat. Yes, more than these things. The most important thing that we could ever provide or give or share is not all the things in this world, but even more than the basic needs that we have as humanity. Our greatest need is still our spiritual need for Jesus Christ. And so I ask you this question. Even in your families, what have you been providing lately? Have you been sharing the gospel through the way that you live your life, through the way that you treat your children, your spouse? Have you been sharing the gospel? That is still a part of working with purpose. The greatest purpose to point people to Jesus Christ, to show them that there's salvation in him. I hope that's challenging to you. I hope that that's that's convicting to your heart. That is the greatest thing that we can provide, give to anyone. So work in a way with purpose that you would share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Second thing is this, trust in God's promise. So verses 5 through 11 here. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man called Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. Verse 10, For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Now, there's a lot going on in this particular passage. So Paul is continuing to share the word of God, and then he is facing, as he often does, opposition. People are reviling him, saying, hey, we don't want to hear this nonsense. We don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And we see him say something here. He says, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And in a way, this sounds kind of like, I don't know, The response isn't one you would think like, wow, Paul is being very gracious. But this also speaks to the reality that when you share the gospel message of Jesus Christ, it's not always going to be met with people who are saying, wow, that sounds great. Tell me more. Can we meet up and talk more about this Jesus? Oftentimes in the world, you will face opposition. But what Paul shows here is that the calling God has placed on his life, he is continuing to obey and live out. That even if they were to reject him, he has done his part. 
It's not that he's unloving or cold. It's the reality that he's living out the call. He's still doing what God has called him to do. He cannot control who's going to accept or believe the message of the gospel of Jesus. He knows that there's power in it, that he's preaching it because God has called him to do it. But if these people are unwilling, then he moves on. And there's a surrender to God in that. You know, he's trusting in the promise of God and the calling of God on his life. And it's interesting, so he leaves the synagogue and he's no longer going to go there because they're pushing him out, but then he goes to live with this guy, Crispus, right, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord and together with his whole household. And where does he live? He lives right next door, right? So he's continuing to be in a place where he knows he can continue to share the gospel message of Jesus. And there are going to be people around who are interested, who may listen and hear and believe and be saved. And so in every other place that Paul has been, we've seen this kind of adversity that he's faced. He's faced dangers. Remember, again, he's been beaten within inches of his life. He was literally left for dead. They were like, oh, we got him good. He's going to die, so we're going to move on. And yet he continues to be strengthened by God because he's called him to it. His time has not yet come. And so he's here now sharing the message of Jesus Christ. And in this place... In this place, God gives to him a very particular promise. But before we go to that, I, you know, I, I sometimes think that being a Christian in America, or saying that you're a Christian in America, but even just believing, truly believing, and living life in America, sometimes I think we think about our Christianity as inconsequential. That there's not much weight to it. And one of the reasons I think that is, is because America, in America, Christians can become so complacent. We have a lot. We can believe what we believe and keep it to ourselves. We don't have to worry about people reviling us as long as we keep quiet. We don't have to worry about someone killing us, asking us to choose between Death right now or Jesus Christ and following him? Sharing the gospel or being put in jail? And so there's a lot of too much comfort, I think, in our Christianity. Where we're not challenged in the way that many Christians in other parts of the world are, but what we've seen Paul go through. And I wonder if we were truly tested facing such dangers and hardships just for following Jesus Christ that Paul did, as well as other Christians. I wonder what would happen. I wonder what we would do if we were faced with such a test in our lives. We rarely have to worry about losing our lives. We aren't really tested to see if we're willing to give our lives for the sake of sharing the gospel. But I believe that God calls us to have the mentality, the urgency. I mean, souls are at stake. So many people walking around in this world living with a purpose that ends with eternal separation from God. And we who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, what are we waiting for to share the gospel? Oh, I'm not ready yet. I need to learn more. I need to read another book. Uh, I need to prepare a little while longer. Just share the message of Jesus Christ. You don't have to know everything about the Bible. You don't have to know all the ins and outs of Scripture. If you know the simplicity of the gospel message of Jesus Christ, trust in God. He's with you. He's for you. He gives promises to us as we are called to share his gospel. In verse 9, God tells Paul that he will be safe, that God will keep him physically safe from harm, and that he'll have God's protection over him as he preaches the gospel in Corinth. And so you think about that. This gives Paul freedom. He was already willing to do it. He's already been beaten within inches of his life. He's already been unjustly incarcerated. He's gone through things, but here in Corinth, think about what a burden is lifted 
if he just trusts in this promise that whatever I do, I know that God's hand of protection is over me. And there's a very specific purpose for Paul in Corinth. As it tells us in verse 10, God says he has many who would come to know him through the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this is the saving message that every person needs, and God is calling Paul to preach it in Corinth, and he gives this promise that so long as you preach the gospel message, you will be unharmed, you will be safe. And so though Paul may not know exactly who will repent and believe in Jesus Christ, he preaches the gospel that all who hear would have the opportunity to repent and to become a part of the people of God by grace, through faith. And so here we see the promise of God in a very specific way to the Apostle Paul as he's sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we too, as believers, we have more than an abundance of promises that God puts into our lives. Promises that he will keep because he is a good and just and holy God who never does wrong. And here are some verses, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It tells us that in all things, God is working for the good of his people. So if you are a believer of Jesus Christ, God is always in all things working for your good. Imagine if that promise was at the forefront of your mind as you lived your life. And even as you count the cost, perhaps, of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with that friend or with that family member, Be bold, because in all things, God will work for your good. And so spend your time in life doing the things that God has called you to do, whatever it may cost you. Whatever the response may be, he's working for our good, whatever we go through. Romans 8, 38 tells us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. What a promise. Once we are his, we are always his. This should continue to keep us motivated and to continue to keep us going. You know, some people say, Pastor Josh, if you just preach grace, won't people take it for granted? Won't people just say, well, if you just say once saved, always saved, then won't someone who just believes in Jesus go and live life in the world and do whatever they want, however they want? And I will say, no, someone who's truly touched by the grace of Jesus Christ cannot go on living the way that they once did when their purpose was for this world. Because your purpose has changed. And that love, what a promise. That even when you feel far away from God, That even when you're in the lowest places of stumbling in your walk with the Lord, God does not condemn you, but he showers you with his love and grace. And so someone who receives that doesn't say, oh, well now I can go do whatever I want to again. They say, my goodness, Jesus, thank you. I know that it cost you, that you died on the cross for my sins and you rose again. You endured what I should have endured. Thank you, God, for your grace. And then you go on sharing the gospel, living your life for him. So trust in God's promises. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 tells us that the one who began the good work in us, that God is the one who called us to himself, that even that was a gift of God, a grace of God, and he will carry on into completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And these are just three promises of so many promises that God gives to us in his word. I want to encourage you to look into the word of God. Have verses that you enjoy and you can hold on to that strengthen you to continue to live your call as a believer of Jesus Christ. Read the Bible, yes. But having specific verses can be so helpful. I know people who have post-it notes and they, they, they put different memory verses all around the house in different places that they go. So that in the morning when they brush their teeth, they have a post-it right there as they're brushing their teeth about God's goodness, his promises. By the coffee pot, on the fridge, in the bedroom, everywhere they go where they know they'll look so that on their mind, on their heart, will be the promises of God that they can trust in so that as they live their life, they'll remember what it's for, who it's for. 
and that they'll be able to be bold in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's trust in God's promises. Lastly, it's this, trust in God's providence. He has everything under his control and everything, again, Romans 8.28, God is working for our good in all things. Verse 12 says this, but when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal, and they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. So there's an aspect of God's providence as he promises to keep Paul safe. We see that here, before he even has to open his mouth, that Gallio speaks. And so he doesn't have to even necessarily defend himself here. All things are taken care of. The promise that God makes to Paul, it's God is providing for him. And there's a providence of the things that are working out of the promises of God. And we see, we remember that, that God said to him, I have many people here in this city. So even in that phrase, what does it mean that God had many people in that city? Does it mean that there were already many Christians there? Well, no, there hasn't been that evangelism there yet. But that's what Paul is there to do. And so God is promising that there will be people who come to faith in Jesus Christ. So you keep on preaching and sharing the gospel message. And so what's happening here is the same thing that we've ha seen happen to Paul and other apostles. False charges being brought against them, trying to use the government that's in power to prosecute and to persecute the Christians. And we see here that Paul is under attack from the Jewish people and leadership. But what happens? Gallio says, I don't want anything to do with these religious matters of the Jews. And so actually in his ruling here, he sets a precedence that actually works in favor for Christians. Because he's basically saying, I'm not going to prosecute or criminalize someone for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ because that's your own stuff. You deal with those things on your own. And it might not seem like a big thing here at this moment, but this is God's providence that through this, now Christians will be able to more freely from the burden of being somehow put in jail or uh, persecuted or prosecuted legally, criminally, for sharing the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And so even in the logistical things and the legalities of things, God is covering over so that the gospel of Jesus Christ can be preached. That's an awesome thing. I hope we see that even in these what seemingly little things that happen. God uses people. God uses situations and circumstances to work for the good of his people. Now, before we, we close, I, I do want to talk about this man named Sosthenes in verse 17 that gets beaten, right, at the end of this passage. So if that not, name sounds familiar to you, that's good because we see that he's talked about in the book of 1 Corinthians as a fellow believer of Jesus Christ. So he's not a believer here yet, and we're not sure if it's the same Sosthenes, but I like to think that it's certainly possible that this Sosthenes, who was trying to persecute and prosecute against the Apostle Paul, by the grace of God, through Paul's continual following of the call to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, that yes, Sosthenes also came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior later on. I like to think that way. But maybe because I'm kind of like, I don't know, like it's kind of like a hopeless romantic kind of thing, right? It's, it all works out in the end. But God is continually working. And, and there are people who are once enemies of God. We are all enemies of God apart from Christ. But through the gospel message of Jesus Christ, every single one of you, think about how you became a believer of Jesus Christ. If you're truly a believer of Jesus Christ, you were told or someone shared the gospel message with you at some point in your life. The 
the gospel message of Jesus Christ. We are called to share the gospel. Will you share that with those around you? We're probably familiar, many of us, with the story of a missionary named Jim Elliott. Uh, he was a missionary in Ecuador, or to Ecuador, and he prepared for years to go and meet this Alca tribe in, in the jungles of Ecuador. And this was a tribe that had, up to that point, killed every outsider that ever tried to step foot into their land. But he felt convicted to share the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And so they had planned for years. They had trained. And then they went. They landed their plane on a little beach that they found when they were flying overhead. He was a young man, still in his late 20s. And the story goes, what happens was they saw some of the tribe show up when they first had land. And then they kind of went back into the jungle. And the next time they saw, they saw some women from the tribe that had come out. And Jim Elliot, he was with four other missionaries, but so excited because he thought maybe they were coming to, to talk with them that he began wading into the river that was before them as to meet them. But what he quickly realized was that they were not in a good mood and ready to hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ but instead that they looked quite angry. And when he realized that on another side of him, he heard some hooping and hollering. And when he turned around, what he saw was men from the tribe holding spears. And so he thought to himself, because he had a little gun with him, should I defend myself? But they had made a commitment when they went into this place, to this dangerous place to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they would not take the life of any of the people in the Alka tribe because they did not know Jesus Christ yet. And so he decided not to defend himself in that moment. And what happened next is that he was killed along with his four missionary partners. Just think about that. A young man with what we would say the rest of his life ahead of him. We might think to ourselves, what good did that do for these young men, these missionaries, to go to a dangerous place just because they had a call to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, they go and they're not even able to share the gospel and almost immediately upon their landing, meeting with the tribe, their first interaction, they die, they're killed. What a useless mission trip. That's what you might think. And yet what a beautiful thing for people to take truly with conviction the call to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there is a willingness that even if I face death, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to obey the call to share the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And the amazing thing is that his wife, Jim Elliott's wife, Elizabeth Elliott, and her daughter, as well as one other person, Years later, they go to the same tribe. But this time, they're met with a more openness of heart. And many in the Alka's tribe place their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Is that not an awesome story? There was a great cause, yes. Even their own lives. But Jim Elliot knew where he would go if he were to die. He knew that he would be with God forever in eternity because of what he knew about Christ Jesus, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And through that, through that following the call, it opened a door that years later, many in the tribe will come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior through his wife and daughter. Just think about that. So God is always working. 
Trust in God. Work with purpose of sharing the gospel. Trust in his promises as you share the gospel. They are real. They are true. They are for you. Trust in God's providence as you share the gospel. There are many who will come to know Jesus Christ. There are many in your family, in your friendship circles, in your workplace that are God's. And they just need someone to share the gospel with them. So will that be you? I pray that it will be. Let's pray together. Dear God, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your promises. God, I pray that you would put in our hearts a strong calling and conviction. If we are believers of Jesus Christ, we need to share the message of the gospel. God, I pray that everyone here would think of one or two people, and it may start in our homes with family. I pray that you put it on our hearts to, yes, prepare, but then to boldly share the gospel. I pray that we'd stop making excuses, that we'd stop worrying and being anxious, but that we'd surrender all those things to you and just trust in you. And God, would you work mightily through us that many more people will come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We thank you. pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.